We have been very busy over the last 17 months, and with now 27 days to go before voters go to the polls, uh, we kicked off uh, this week what we're calling our Main Street Tour, and Main Street Votes No. And we're very excited today uh, for, for our event in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area uh, to be joined by uh, Marilyn Carlson Nelson, who uh, is a leader uh, within this community and understands uh, how Main Street decisions are made. It's very important right now. We are 27 days out from the election. And I'm just going to take a moment to tell you a little bit about my own personal vote no journey. And it wasn't hard to get to this journey for me, um, partly because I know that this is about civil rights, and this is about, the proposed amendment is about putting something that really spreads a chilling climate across our state into the state constitution. I think the state constitution is a very special document and should be protected for the highest and most important things. And then sometimes the things about running government. And frankly, I really believe that this amendment does damage to our ability to recruit, our ability to retain, and our ability to attract both the talent that we need in this state to do the work of business going forward. I can tell you that by 2018, 70% of the jobs in Minnesota will require a college education or a two-year degree or certificate. That type of environment is the type of environment that we need to attract smart, diverse people to our ranks. And so that is why I'm here today, to say please vote no, and please talk to others about voting no. Because to keep Minnesota, the Minnesota that we love, we want to make sure that we can specifically retain as well as attract new talent. And voting no is the best way to do that. It's my great pleasure today to introduce to you someone who almost needs no introduction. But I do think the introduction tells us things about her that are so important. Richard talked about Marilyn being a civic leader and a statewide leader. She is also a national leader. Of course, she's the chairman and the former CEO of Carlson, which worldwide includes such brands as Carlson Wagon with Travel, TGI Fridays, Radisson Hotels, and has 170,000 employees worldwide. Forbes named her one of the world's most 100 powerful women. I would say in my book, she is one of my top admired women <coughs> in the world. Top five for me, Marilyn. How's that? <laughs> she serves on the UN Global Compact, the Committee on Encouraging Corporate Philanthropy, the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, and is chair of the Mayo Clinic Board of Trustees as well. What we so appreciate about her is her strong voice on the Vote No campaign. She was one of the very first, the first business leader to speak out and write an editorial in the Star Tribune that encouraged people to take a personal stand from a business point of view Writing that op-ed, she launched her into a spokesperson for this campaign. She has shared her views at gatherings around the state, in private homes, in workplaces, and today here on campus. We are so pleased that she is with us, adding her voice again to the Vote No campaign. Marilyn Carlson Nelson. Our challenge truly is to remain a dynamic, welcoming community. 
for going to attract the best and the brightest talent into our universities, our colleges, our businesses, our political offices, and our community organizations. This amendment absolutely puts that imperative in jeopardy. I really thank you all for coming today. I'm delighted to be speaking to this audience in particular. It seems only right that we should have this conversation in this setting, at this university, whose Senate has come out in opposition to this amendment. And with this audience that is well-informed, data-driven, and frankly, our greatest hope for stopping this amendment from passing. Your choice to sit it out or to engage will very likely decide this vote. Over the years, as Margaret mentioned, in my role as a business leader, I've been asked to speak on many topics at varied venues around the world. But to be perfectly honest, never in my mind's eye did I ever imagine kind of gatherings that I've been participating in around this issue. In churches, in businesses, in living rooms, in basements, in college campuses, in these settings where thoughtful, caring people are coming together to defend the civil rights of our neighbors, <coughs> our colleagues, and our loved ones. Frankly, it feels a little like something from the days of the Underground Railroad, but then I'm always reminded of some of my favorite words of Hubert Humphrey. He said, freedom does not fall freely as rain. It must be earned by every generation. Well, my generation fought for the civil rights of minorities, fought for women's rights, and now we're pleased to join you in this human rights struggle of this generation. This is truly unfinished business. And we are being called up. You are being called up. It's your turn to fight to preserve the inalienable rights of us all. Life, liberty, and one of the most cherished, of course, the pursuit of happiness. Some of you may have seen the op-ed that Margaret referred to that I wrote in the Star and Tribune earlier this year in opposition to this men marriage amendment. Now some of you may have taken my class or others of you who know me in this setting or others around the university know that I am not lacking in issues that I feel passionate about. But I have written very few opinion pieces. I was moved to speak out on this particular issue because I find it to be injurious and counterproductive to all that I treasure and all that I have fought for my entire life as a mom, as a grandma, as a business leader, as a Minnesotan, and as a person of deep and abiding faith. Since the editorial appeared and went viral, I've had the blessing of hearing from so many, certainly from Carlson employees around the world, but also from many people that I had never met, each of them telling stories heart-rending stories of aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, friends, colleagues, children, who are in our communities, but not completely of our communities, because they have been marginalized. They have been denied full acceptance and equal participation due to nothing more than their sexual orientation. Stories of broken families, of alienation, of suicide, stories of talented siblings being raised side by side, same school, same church, or synagogue, or mosque, suddenly, same values in a family, all of a sudden reaching, perhaps, puberty, and one denied acceptance, denied affirmation, and denied civil rights. I hate but I appreciate the support and the enthusiasm for my supporting this issue that came to me through those emails. But the truth is, I think we're here because all of us in this audience have a sense that we will be remembered for this. That this is our collective moment to take a stand. 
It will be part of our legacy as a community. For those of you in the Carlson School, I can assure you that business is but one interested party in the outcome of this vote, but certainly one that brings a unique perspective. This is why I'm especially grateful that several business leaders are publicly opposing this amendment. Greg Page at Cargill, Ken Poe of General Mills, Charlie Zelli of Jefferson Lounge, John Taft of RBC, and this very week, Tony Satterley at Cummins for, and former Medtronic CEO, you've read Bill George's comments, Medtronic Vice Chair Glenn Nelson, and many others who every day are stepping forward individually and collectively to encourage this community to take a stand. In a way, people keep saying, what is business doing? Business actually took its stand quite a while ago. All across this state, businesses have been speaking out on the issue of gay equality. For nearly 300 businesses, including the University of Minnesota and a majority of our state's Fortune 500 companies, grant partner health benefits. Now that's not one of those mandates that we've been hearing a lot about lately. That has been a business choice. Now why would businesses add to their costs and make a choice if they didn't feel there was a true cost benefit. Businesses choose to do this because we know that creating a work environment that is welcoming, fair, and values all employees is key to building not only cultures of respect, but to be consistent with our expectation that we treat employees, customers, and shareholders all fairly. Enlightened business leaders also know that as the economy begins to turn around, and it is, the talent wars will heat up again, and competition for the best and the brightest will intensify. Thinking beyond the complexity of today's slow growth and unemployment, Carlson, like many other Minnesota firms, has worked very hard to be known as a model of inclusivity in order to draw from the entire talent pool. It is consistent then to want our community, the context in which we do our business, to be equally inclusive and welcoming. As Minnesotans, we take a lot of pride, don't we? In all the top spots that we earn in every quality of life category that matters. You know, the Fortune 500 companies, the most Fortune 500 companies per capita, the highest high school graduation rates, the highest volunteer rates here in Minnesota, highest volunteer rates in the whole country, the most theater seats per capita, the best biking trails, the best health care system, and now, thanks to the Carlson School, the highest MBA placement rate in the country. This amendment puts what you might call our Minnesota brand at risk. It hangs a sign on our door, like some of these other states, that some are just not quite as welcome here. This is not only going to disadvantage us with the gay population, but in fact, studies show it will disadvantage us with the young talent that we need to continually infuse our state <coughs> with energy and innovation. Carnegie Mellon professor Richard Florida, very well respected, calls this young group the creative class. It's the fast growing, highly educated, well paid segment of the workforce from business to high tech to the sciences, the arts, that fuels economic vitality. He notes that places that succeed in attracting and retaining creative people prosper, and those that don't fail. <coughs> when this creative class is sizing up companies to live in, or to attend college in, or to stay in after college to start a business, Professor Florida's research shows that the community's acceptance of diversity, specifically gays, 
is a key indicator of their evaluation. By many measures, passage of this amendment would be harmful to our state's competitiveness. The one thing, the one thing I'm quite sure that it would not harm is the institution of marriage. <laughs> <laughs>
Yet we are subjected to anti-gay protesters shouting hate speech at the funerals of gay soldiers. And as we watch, we watched in disbelief on Mother's Day as a Christian pastor in North Carolina recommended from the pulpit that gays be enclosed in fences until they die from their inability to procreate. <laughs> there's nothing, there's nothing you can call that but adult bullying. And if we have any hope of teaching our children to be respected, to be tolerant of differences, and not to be little others, we must put an end to it. And let's not forget the parents of gay children who also are taking their cues from a society that marginalizes and discriminates against our gay population. The result is that some of these otherwise very caring, good parents feel guilty. Some feel ashamed. Some are so unable to see their child as just another variation among children that they drive that child away. Some even throw them out. Imagine how I felt when I visited with our family foundation the bridge for one of runaway youth. I was told that 46% of the beds are occupied by GLBT youth who are not welcome in their own homes. That's not just a statistic. These are our children who are being discarded. <clears throat> and it should give us all pause about the messages that our society sends about the value of our gay children. As a mother who lost a daughter in a car accident when she was 19 years old, I can't tell you how it makes me feel and how deeply it saddens me that any parent would risk losing a child, possibly forever, in this manner. No wonder the American Academy of Pediatricians has publicly stated that passing this amendment would be damaging to children. Ultimately, like I'm sure so many of you, I was taught to unto others to love my neighbor. No one taught me love only some of your neighbors or do only unto some as you wish they do unto you. And I was taught in school as I was so proud to salute my flag that everyone has inalienable rights to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. This is our nation's promise. So that's why I'm here, because that's why Minnesota's vote is so important. It's believed that we have the best shot in the nation of holding back this march of inequality. We can do this. We have the courage and the common sense to lead, not to follow. And it matters a great deal. It matters to those who have denied equal rights under the law. It matters to our children, our grandchildren because experts predict whatever the voter's judgment is, it is likely to decide the answer on this issue for an entire generation. And equally important, if it matters to all the people of Minnesota, this amendment is just not us. It does not reflect our values. This is not what we stand for. And because of that, I truly believe we will vote no. No, we will not use our Constitution as an instrument of discrimination. No, we will not disadvantage the competitiveness of our state. No, we will not entomb future generations with our prejudices. And no, we will most definitely not be led down this road of inequality. For the sake of our quality of life, for the sake of generations to come, our road must, that road, the road of that discrimination, has to end at the Minnesota state line. 
and you will help make sure that that happens. I'm optimistic that we are going to defeat this amendment, but I'm not naive. All indications are that it's going to be very, very close. That's why every individual action that each of us takes in these next few days is absolutely essential to a positive outcome. There isn't one of you in this room that doesn't have a platform to, to influence this issue, whether it's through your social network, through your financial resources, having the courage to talk to your family more broadly. I urge you to engage with all that you can bring to bear to defeat this amendment. And I know your generation has much that you can bring to bear because you are, after all, the masters of social media. I also know that given the demographics in this room, that I'm preaching mostly to the converted. Polls tell us that 60% of the voters under 45 oppose the amendment. But it's very risky for us to think that that's also the view of the majority of those who will vote. We mustn't get complacent. Each of us has had the extraordinary privilege of being born in a country where our vote counts. In a race this close, yours very well could be the vote that will make the difference. We must look upon this challenge as another opportunity for Minnesota to earn a top spot, to go down in history as the first state to push back on this attempt to withhold the benefits, the responsibilities, and the joys of marriage from some targeted population. Let's not wake up on November 7th to a Minnesota that has condemned your generation and your children to several decades of vitriolic debate and enormous expense to overturn an injustice that we can solve together. Let's instead wake up to a Minnesota that has, once again, made us deeply proud. Perhaps this poem that I've carried as a kind of mantra for my life is something I can leave you with, because there will be many times when we will have to stand up for those who've been excluded. It's an Edward Markham poem, and it goes like this. He did a circle and left me out, heretic villain, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a bigger circle.